Starting off tonight with Infinite Reflection Baltic Porter from Sucrum's Brewing in Winnipeg. They describe it as having roasty coffee aromatics alongside robust malt flavors and hints of dark fruit. So I wasn't planning on doing another teardown so soon after the last one, but I was out walking around and this teardown pretty much literally dropped in my lap. So here we go. One muddy, skanky, old, oh God, what a mess. Um, cable modem. I probably should have cleaned that up before I did this, but well, we're here now, so let's go with it. This is an Eris model TM602G cable modem. On the back, we can see that it has an F-type cable TV connector, a AC power input, there's a reset button there, the USB connection, there is a Ethernet connection, it's labeled 10 slash 100, so obviously not the most modern of pieces of equipment. And it has two RJ11 telephone jacks on it. This particular box is used by our local cable company just as a digital telephone terminal, nothing else. It can do more, but that's all they use it for, I guess because it is older equipment. Here's the manufacturer's data sheet. They, oh hey, with integrated battery backup. Hmm, I may have to extract that if it, and see if it's any good. So this thing is capable basically over the cable TV plant of providing two voice over IP lines that plug into normal telephone jacks. So you can use your old landline phone or reuse it, plus high speed data access. Again, high speed being up to uh, 100 uh, megabit per second. It runs on the DOCSIS 2 cable standard. High speed internet, as we said, via 10 or 100. Mm. Oh, okay. Or ethernet over USB 1.1. That's what it does. Interesting. So they keep going on about this battery option. Includes the first and only two cell lithium ion solution for up to eight hours of standby. Okay, based on the language of that and the fact that it's only got a 10 slash 100 ethernet connection, I'm going to guess this is quite old technology. There's the specs. If you're interested, you can pause this at some point if you want. Ah, yes, it is old technology. 2008. Wow. Not much else to learn here. Let's just tear the thing apart. Obviously, I'm not going to use it for anything. And boy, is my workbench going to need cleaning up after this. So on this side, we have the battery compartment. That came out easily enough. That looks like... Ah. Now, that looks like it's a strap to yoink the battery out, but obviously it doesn't want to come out. If you thought that last teardown was violent, you ain't seen nothing yet. So there's the battery pack. It claims to be 8.4 volts, uh, 4,400 milliamp hours. Charges at uh, 115 milliamps or 33 watt hours. Okay. What are the odds that a 2008 vintage battery is going to have any jam left in it at all? I think we'll set that aside for later exploration. And see what's in here underneath all that. Of course, now the question is how to get into it. The obvious choice is to look underneath there for screws. Yep. The feet always hide the screws. Looks like there's four of them here. Will that fit? That'll do. Okay. Ah. But I doubt it. Okay, there is that. That is just the case. And does that just lift right out? Oh, wow. That's nice. Okay. Uh, there's some light pipes for the LEDs on the front panel. Ah, we've got the connector for the battery. 
that might come in handy if the battery is any good at all. Let me just uh, right. That's a lot less muddy and messy. First thing we have over here is a very obvious power supply section. There is the AC coming in. We have an MOV. We have a thermistor. We have a fuse. We have a capacitor across it. And then we have a couple of uh, uh, chokes in series with that. That's all just going to clean up the power, both coming in and whatever ugliness this thing creates going back out again. Then we have our good old friend, the full bridge rectifier. No, I'm not going to say it like he does. Uh, followed by a big smoothing capacitor. And then over here we have a chip and a transistor. Couldn't find any information about that one online, but I'm going to guess it's a switchboard power supply chip. Then we have a transformer bridging over the generous slots there. Look at that. That is some isolation. Uh, we have also bridging across the gap two opto-isolators, which will be providing feedback into this guy. And we have a uh, little capacitor in there. I think it's class Y, is it? Class X1, Y1 capacitor. So that looks like a very solidly designed power supply. Good isolation, good filtering on it. Exactly what you'd expect to see. So after the transformer, as you'd expect, we have a dual diode, we have some filtering capacitors, we have a couple of transistors and a couple of diode packages in SOT23 format that will be creating the reference for and driving the LED side of those two guys. Uh, what else do we have in here? A couple of inductors down in there. I'm assuming those are just filtering to go with these this guy is marked U, and I can't read its designation, but since it's got, you know, capacitor and a larger inductor, it's probably either a boost or a buck circuit going on in there. So over here we have, what are you? LM324, which is a dual op amp package. So I'm going to guess that that has to do with uh, measuring the, the charging circuit, possibly uh, uses as a comparator, for the uh, for the battery voltages on the charging, possibly looking at battery balancing because there's so many pins over there. Another diode package, several of those heavy diode packages. Okay, so that will all be dealing with the battery charging, and there is a battery indicator, battery status indicator. Then just to the left of that whole setup, we have a little what looks like a programming header. Not a lot of labeling on the back of it few zero ohm resistors around it for some reason there's very little going on in the back there's a few passives a couple of diodes and stuff like that um that one little transistor but then we have this package up in the corner here let's see what he is Zilog zbf 082 ah blah 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 oh, uh date code uh 42nd week of 2009 that goes along with the 2008 that was in the manual, so that dates this thing pretty precisely. That Zilog chip is an 8-bit microcontroller with extended peripherals. Woohoo! Oh, it's got all kinds of stuff going on inside it. GPIO, internal oscillator, 10-bit analog to digital, analog comparators, temperature sensors, UART. All the things you would expect from a microcontroller. Anyway, let's get back to what we were looking at before we got distracted there. So we got all these little surface mount LEDs up front that uh, went through some light pipes that I already threw in the garbage because they were disgusting. Uh, what is this little chip down here? M28313CS. Can't find the exact match for him, but most of the things with the same root look like 128K EEPROM, so I'm going to See, that's probably what it is. Though if it's an EEPROM, it's a little bit far away from the processing going on. Where's that other microcontroller? It's way over there. So yeah, I'm guessing that it probably belongs to one of these big guys in here. So now over on the left-hand side, those transformers, the big diodes and capacitors, 
those lead me to believe that we are talking to the two phone lines, two RJ45 jacks, or RJ11 jacks, sorry. And normally, you would just expect these to be two paralleled ones, but no, they're not. If you look, they're two separate circuits going back here, and everything's mirrored. So, And in the data sheet, we saw for the device that it can have two different voice over IP uh, lines on it. So that's what's going on in there. Some line driving down there, everything else, isolation from the line. Although I would have expected those transformers to be way over here, but yeah, whatever. It's even got a pair of 330 ohm resistors, you know, one for each line of each circuit, just to match the 600 ohm nominal impedance of a dial-up phone line. Cool. I'm guessing that this dude is in charge of the telephony stuff. Let me go see if I can find that data sheet. Dual channel wideband tracking battery voice port device. Battery, because on a telephone line, on a standard uh, dial-up telephone line, there is voltage on the pair with the audio. Um, and in telephony terms, it's called battery voltage. This chip is designed for exactly this purpose. <laughs> I don't see any beet soup in here. They were just really reaching for that acronym. So now then we get down into these three big chips in here. This TI chip, again, I couldn't find a lot of information on it, but I'm going to guess that it is dealing with the Ethernet stuff. Um, just because there's the Ethernet and the USB uh, network connection, which both have lines going back to it, so that makes a certain amount of sense. Then these two with custom firmware on them, let me just peel those two stickers off and see if we can see what the chip is underneath them, although I'm not holding out a lot of hope that this is going to tell us much. Hynix HY5DU561622 FTP. Okay, and this guy here, when I cleaned the goop off it, I think I scrubbed part of the part number off. I'm going to look a little bit closer and see what I can find on that, but I'm not holding out a lot of hope. We'll see. Well, that wasn't so hard to find after all. It's just 256 megs of uh, DDR SD RAM. Hmm. And that other one, after staring at it for a while under various bits of magnification, is a 32 meg flash memory. Okay. Sure. So those two will be serving that big TI chip in the middle. All right. So that makes sense. That is RAM and uh, flash memory servicing this uh, big TI chip that I can't find out anything about which is obviously going to be a processor uh, with Ethernet and USB natively on it. There is a crystal that is no doubt clocking it. You can actually see some traces going from it through the loading capacitors and into it, so that makes sense. Also, it's got some programming headers down there, which also makes sense to have close to that. So that is most of the mysteries, at least as far as I can get. Except for what's underneath this RF shielding can here. Nice, it's not soldered down. Now, first thing in after the connector, we have a bunch of inductors, bunch of capacitors, this big honking inductor, more little surface mount inductors. So that is just RF filtering. We have two different sections over here. One will be transmit, one will be receive onto the cable at different frequencies because uh, the uplink and downlink on a cable TV plant is significantly different frequencies. Uh, we have a little chip in there, looks like TI logo on it and a crystal. In here we have a, that's probably a transformer and a handful of passives. Okay, and what else is going on down in there? Can we see any closer? You know what? I got this thing from Banggood to use. I might as well use it. Okay, that's better. So there you can get a little bit closer look at the 
input section, the RF input section to the outside world with all of its inductors and stuff. And I stand by my original suggestion that that is the combining filtering of both the receive and transmit section going out that connector there. So now we'll slide over closer to this little chip in its environment. What does that crystal say? 16 meg. It's reasonable for a clock. Am I two zero? Is that a five, six? Maybe AE? Hmm. I don't recognize that logo. Initially, I thought it was TI from a distance, but when you get up close, that ain't it. Well, there we go. That wasn't so hard to find after all. It is a single chip broadband tuner which I guess makes sense. You can tune anywhere from 48 megahertz up to uh, one gigahertz, 3.3 volt power supply. Do, 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 do. No tunable parts required. It does everything inside. Oh, cool. It also has some GPIO so that it can be controlled, which makes sense. Operates with a 16 meg crystal. Yes, it does. Applications in VoIP telephony modems, cable modems, and packet cable. Wow. That's exactly what it's being used for. We'll zoom back out again, see what else is in there. FL20, that is going to just be an RF filter. But other than that, it's just a whole bunch of capacitors and resistors on that side. Let's go over to this other side here, the other side of the splitter essentially. So that first side, so this side, will be receiving the incoming signal, which means that this side will be probably doing the transmitting. I'm guessing signals coming from there. I'm not sure. I don't see anything generating RF in there. A couple of what look like diode packages in SOT23 type packages. And then that guy is going to be a transformer. This guy here. What else is going on in there? Not too much in that side. Hmm. For an RF uh, enclosure, I was expecting a lot more weirdness, but that's fairly standard kind of stuff in there. Okay. So I think that is about all the intelligence we can gain out of this board without, you know, going crazy on it. The last thing I want to do is crack open this battery here. Hopefully without blowing myself up and, uh, see what's inside it and see if they can be salvaged Let's just peel that bit off and this is going to be heat sealed together which means more violence and abuse as we've learned from our scottish friend using the right tool for the job is exactly what you need when you're going to get violent with these things aha that sounds successful sticker out of the way oh no I voided the warranty whatever will I do oh look it's 18650s what a novel technology well, they were talking about how it was a new technology at the time now uh, let's see if we can get those out of there those two and see okay that's what it is it's uh, two S two P, two in series, two in parallel. There's one end. There's the other end, and there's some balanced charging leads. Okay, I don't expect to find any voltage on there. Oh hey, two point one volts on that guy, two point zero volts on that guy, two point zero volts on that guy, and this will be two point one because series parallel. Hmm, those might actually be rescuable after all. Oh, a protection circuit. That may have saved us. All in all, I'm impressed with the build quality of this product and the design. Nice fuse on the battery module. That's a very nice touch. I'm guessing that is the charge control and that will be the two MOSFETs that disconnect it, probably. I like it. I'm not going to use it, but I like it. Now, I will disconnect these into individual cells and throw them into my battery conditioner charger unit here and uh, 
see what happens with them. Well, that was another successful and entertaining teardown. And I might even get lucky and get some, uh, some cells out of it that I can uh, use. This thing didn't immediately say abort mission when I plugged it in, so maybe they're still good. We'll see. It's going to take some time. I'm charging them slowly. So this crusty, rusty old board, I don't know that there's anything of any value for me to salvage off it. The connectors are all corroded. Um, maybe, you know, the bridge rectifier, some of those capacitors, maybe the MOV. But other than that, there's not a lot of salvage value in this thing. Uh, maybe the telephone isolation transformers, because those are going to be just a one-to-one -one 600 ohm transformer. So that could come in handy, maybe, for audio isolation kind of purposes. Other than that, like I said there's not that much of value on there other than entertainment value. Oh, thanks again for watching. I appreciate that always. Um, any questions or comments down in the comment section as usual. I'll put the results of these, uh, these lithium-ion cells uh, down in the description after I finished messing with them. I'm going to run them through a charge discharge cycle a couple of times and just see what they can do. Um, yeah, that's everything for tonight. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later.